how prevalent is Islamic law in the West? Well, there are countries apart from South Asia where Islamic law is operational in one way or the other. Islamic law is operational in the United Kingdom. Islamic law is operational in France to, to a lesser extent. Islamic law is operational in the United States. Islamic law is operational in some other Western countries. And this might come as a surprise to Muslims themselves. Because for the most part, we believe that the constitution of this country does not accommodate this kind of plurality. It does, and we'll explain that later. I'll give you three examples of how Islamic law in one form or the other is operational in these Western countries. One very, very popular commodity in the field of banking today is Islamic banking. Some of this country's most prominent banking organizations have embraced Islamic banking. Briefly speaking, Islamic banking is choose interest payments as we commonly understand the term. So if one were to go to an Islamic bank, one would not be allowed to invest or deposit $10,000 in the hope of receiving 2% or 5% as a fixed return on that. In Islamic banking, there must be shared liability and shared benefits. That's the key to understanding. It's, it's, it's obviously more complicated than that, but for brevity's sake, let's just restrict the distinction to the fact that in Islamic banking, one is not allowed to engage in any kind of a transaction if one's capital is uh, safeguarded from liability. There's a bank in Ann Arbor called the University Bank. It has an entire section. It's, it's, it's a bank that, that has been owned for generations by, by, by the people, by a family in uh, a Christian family in, in, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and they have, uh, they have an entire department set aside for Islamic banking. S you have banks in, in the Western world that have Islamic banking portfolios. You can buy a car, you can buy a house, not in, in an Islamic institution, but in a secular institution, using Islamic banking principles, rules, and regulations. And it's such a growing phenomenon that major banks are seriously considering opening up portfolios that would deal exclusively with Islamic banking. With regard to the other example, you have Muslim family law. You have no choice but to accommodate people who come into this country from the Muslim world and are married, have had their marriages performed in, in, in accordance with Islamic law. So if you had people come in from Pakistan, for instance, or people come in from Malaysia, or people come in from Saudi Arabia, or from Egypt, then there is, their marriages have been performed according to Islamic law to a greater or lesser extent. When those marriages come to the United States, they bring with them certain contractual stipulations. And if, God forbid, that marriage is on the verge of dissolution, then those contractual stipulations become pertinent. And that matter becomes contentious and ends up in front of a, a, a judge in this country. And he has no recourse but to refer to Islamic law or at least to read into it, if not in the interest of, if not in keeping with, with American law, then at least in keeping with two things, what is known as the law of comity or just pure humanitarian needs. 
The law of comity is an, is an, an international understanding amongst nations that each nation's legal system would be recognized. If we decide not to recognize the legal system of Benin, because it's slightly bigger than the greater Miami area, for instance, then we could have serious problems because much of the world comprises of Benins. There are many, many small, insignificant countries. And we will, at some point in our existence, encounter some aspect of, law, of the law that is Benini. I think I'm right there. Uh, and, and therefore would have no choice but to recognize it. So that's the law of comity. It safeguards us because if, if, we, if we disrespect or, 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 or ignore someone else's national law, then we could very well have ours ignored as well. And then just pure humanitarianism, there's a judge sitting out there looking at this. He says, judge, according to Islamic law, this man had promised me as part of the marital contract when our marriage was performed that he would give me 10,000 US dollars. Or worse still, he would give me 10,000 rupees. Or if she was smart enough, he would give me 10,000 pieces of the going currency in the country in which we live. You see three problems emerging, and they do. I, 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 if you have any interest in this, I would ask that you go and, go and look at LexisNexis and just, just do a search for talaq or look, do a search for mahar, and you'd be surprised at the number of marriages that end up in front of judges who have to decide what to do with the stipulation. Recognizing that stipulation is problematic because it is an implicit recognition of Islamic law, the Sharia, the dreaded Sharia. Not recognizing is problematic because it means that one of these, one of these parties is, is gaining an unlawful advantage, or if not that, then at least an immoral advantage because of migration. You have some very, very interesting developments because of people caught up in these marriages or these divorces. They're sometimes called limping marriages, where a marriage is performed and recognized by both legal systems, but the divorce is only recognized by one legal system, the Islamic or the secular. As far as that individual is concerned, and it's generally a she, she is only half divorced. She is either divorced according to Islamic law, if she got, was able to get, to get that, or divorced according to secular law, if she was able to get that. It's rare that you would find someone living in this country involved in a contentious breakup, being divorced simultaneously with regard to both legal systems. This is an emerging problem that judges in this country are forced to address, whether they recognize, respect, or acknowledge the existence of the Sharia or not. And then we have Muslim culinary habits. The word kausha has, has, has become so much a part of our lexicon that we use it to speak about anything that is legal or acceptable. Now, the Islamic equivalent of that is halal. And so if you go into some parts of this country, you would find there are signs outside saying the food produced, processed in this restaurant or in this particular establishment follows the diktats of, of halal. And that's going to be a growing phenomenon as well. And then you have slaughterhouses emerging. Slaughterhouses will have to follow two jur jurisdictions. One is the jurisdiction of, 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 of secular law within this country with regard to health and so on. And the other is according to Islamic law. For us, it's not too difficult to make this kind of accommodation. For the British as well, but that's, we are not in, in, in Great Britain and we are talking to an audience that, that looks at this as a, that a possible area of, 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 of concern. 